My name's Russell Smith. I'm um, one of a faculty at the Nanyang Business School uh, in Singapore. And I've been asked to moderate this session. Perhaps I wasn't paying attention closely in the first session, so this is my punishment, I'm not sure. But <laughs> we have three papers. Um, <clears throat> mine is first. We've got two excellent papers to follow. And um, we'll take the paper, then the questions, and we'll wrap up by about 12.30. Uh, can you see that all right? Is the reflection too bad? Legible. OK, good. My paper is <clears throat> about the operationalization of um, CSR as extreme opposite end of a spectrum to the paper we had uh, for the keynote. The keynote was highly theoretical. This is much more hands-on and case-driven. Right. I don't think I need to go through the theory of CSR. We should all be familiar with that. I'll just highlight that um, the societal dimensions of CSR, as proposed by Bowen and Carroll, there's an obligation for us to add to the value of society, but there's also responsibility for us to acknowledge society's expectations. It's a two-way street. Um, I'm a bit short on time, so I think I will just pass on that. I would like to talk a little bit about the institutional perspective of CSR. You know, large corporations seek to institutionalize their CSR, and this becomes integral to companies' mission and their vision. And if Halcom says that there's really three elements to this, financial, environmental, and social. And what they're trying to do in the organization, particularly if it's a large international global organization, is to have global CSR impact. But you run into problems. Around the world, we've got disparate economies, societies, politics, environments, and different contexts. We've got developing countries and less developed countries. So how do you deliver CSR across such varying and complex situations? This poses several questions. How can corporate governance be effective globally? How can those actually implementing the CSR be expected to comply fully with the corporate policy for CSR? So really, my fundamental question is, how can large organizations with operations in diverse global settings operationalize their CSR mission? I'm going to look at the tourism sector, and there's some good reasons for this. Um, it's a good vehicle for research. Uh, basically, we get tourism, particularly if it's in a resort setting on the coast, we'll get a consumption of services at that place. Um, lodging, food, transport, and so on. But it brings the tourists and the residents into close contact, and then you get the impact of this on their situation as the tourists spend, congest, pollute, and disrupt local patterns. From well, a research point of view, um, the tourism sector is dominant in these coastal destinations. And this helps us to, to avoid the multiplicity of sectors that you get in other situations. Resorts tend to grow fast. My research has shown earlier that resorts will go from nothing to a city in under two years. And this is encouraged by government. Government wants jobs, they want expansion of household incomes, they want to grow over exports. And, of course, business will oblige. What are we looking at is the hotel operation in these locations. They have a largest employer. They have a high profile. And there's expectation by society in those places that they will contribute back to society. <coughs> Pardon me. I've been trying to chase a respiratory thing for about two months. <coughs> yeah. 
We're examining the operationalization of corporate social responsibility by hotel properties in resort contexts in less developed countries. I'm looking at external CSR, not internal. The reason for that is internal CSR gets complicated with normal operations. It's hard to separate them out. So we just look at external. And I'm using two case areas. One is in Bangtao and Phuket, which is the main situation. And then I'll do a case within a case. And we'll look at Boracay in the Philippines. Stakeholders. Our eminent professor spoke this morning about stakeholders. I'll be coming at this from a different direction. Hotel is implement external CSR in what is called in the literature the CSR landscape. This is unlike their core business which is lodging management and they often work with other stakeholders so they therefore no complete control by hotel management of their CSR that is external to their business. So we see that relationships between stakeholders become central to CSR delivery. And there are a number of stakeholders in this. Hotels, core business is lodging. They have a mix of international domestic guests where leisure is the main motivator in these locations. Hotels are high profile, they have a concentration of tourists. They're a major employer. The local community is another stakeholder. Most of the people in that community will have come there from other parts of the country, seeking better jobs, better incomes. And they're intimately engaged with the tourism sector and the hotels, either directly employed or through indirect jobs, that is, jobs that depend on the tourism sector indirectly, or in informal commerce, that is, in the grey economy. Tourists. They're consumers. They factor in the CSR concerns to their travel planning. And increasingly we're seeing that they will prefer to go to places that are socially and environmentally attuned. And we're getting more evidence in the literature that they're more willing to pay for that as opposed to not. Fourth stakeholder is local government. They have the normal sorts of functions of any local government around the world. It's not specific to tourism, but it operates completely within a dominant tourism sector. Fifth, NGO, often non-profit. They have a narrow focus. We are here to do something in the environment or something in the community. Usually it's not tied to tourism and they exist on grants and donations. And then there are advocates. These are like NGOs, but usually individuals. Um, they have a very narrow focus on something which is special to them. Again, it could be environmental, it could be societal. They depend very heavily on others for implementation. Of these six, there are four leaders. The hotels, local government, NGOs and advocates. Hotels have resources, local government have limited resources, so do the NGOs and the advocates have almost nothing. <coughs> two of those stakeholders are the local community and the tourists are really motivators. Both have a strong two-way relationship with the hotel business. One through jobs in the hotel or being derived indirectly from those hotels. The others as consumers. They motivate the hotels in their different ways to deliver CSR which has impact. Now I want to make a little detour and do a case within a case. I want to talk about flying foxes, bats. Friends of the Flying Fox is a small NGO in Boracay, the Philippines. And Flying Foxes do their 
stuff at night during the day, they hang in trees and sleep. Okay. This little case. Bio cage flying foxes. This is straight out of a, a newspaper report last year. They declined by 86%, down from 15K to 2K bats over a, from 1988 to 2005. And this was linked primarily to the tourism development in Morakei. Does this matter? Yes, it does, because the bats are very important to the island and other nearby islands' ecology because they disperse seeds uh, as they fly. I'll let you dwell on how they do that. We spoke with representatives of Friends of the Flying Foxes. And this is what they said. Well, there was an issue. It was very urgent. And so we started an NGO and we funded it from our own pockets. Continue to speak when we interviewed them last year. Friends of the Flying Fox is a small NGO and has been preserving bats since 2001. But nobody would help us. Until we met with Shangri-La. Shangri-La, if you probably know, has got a property here in Paris. It's a major hotel, luxury, five-star very much up market. And they were serious, they took it seriously. They invested time, there's the money. They removed eight villas that were going to build to preserve the bats. And now they teach their staff and their guests about the bats. Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this sweet? Isn't this so cooperative? Well, of course, it's not like that. Even though it was a very small NGO with no resources, they pressured Shangri-La by enlisting the government and the media. This is a paraphrase from a media report from 2006. Government body required the developer of Shangri-La to submit a development program that addressed specifically the flying foxes. Here's a quote from the same newspaper report. And it noted that Friends of the Flying Foxes were part of a party. So what do we learn from this? Friends of a Flying Fox is a small, volunteer, poorly funded NGO. They enlisted allies, the government and the media. Outcome one, Shangri-La was forced not to build eight villas. Outcome two, Shangri-La turned around and said, we can partner with you, we can learn from you, we can turn this to our advantage as a CSR project. Now you know and I know well, you don't know, but you can assume that Shangri-La, like every other international corporation, has got very tight policy, very tight corporate governance for all of these things. Brand, marketing, financial accounting, human resources, operations, blah, 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 blah. But the question is, can they do that for CSR? Can they have that sort of structure for implementation that's going to handle a situation like Friend of the Flying Foxes? That is the question. All right, let's leave the Borke. Let's go back to Phuket. Um, I talked about the lead stakeholders. I talked about motivators. We've looked at <clears throat> 11 hotels are operating at Bangtao Bay um, and we analyzed this within Burke and Logsdon framework. And this looks at the centrality, we're looking at strategic strengths for the various stakeholders in the situation at uh, Phuket. The centrality, the specificity, there's pro proactivity, volunteerism, and visibility. <coughs> I'm not going to go through all this, you can read the thing later. But if I look at proactivity, you know, this is say, okay, we're going to do projects, are we going to be proactive and go out and find things that will come up? Or are we going to be reactive and just follow problems as we see them? Hotels, well, they focus on projects initiated by others, so they're not proactive. NGOs, my mission is over here somewhere, and I see a problem, I'm going to deal with that. Again, it's low. low the local government, it's reactive. Everybody around the world knows that local government is reactive. The drains are blocked, we'll fix it. And advocates are very much like NGOs. Visibility, <coughs> it's 
good indicator of this is publicity. Do they go out and publicize what we're doing with CSR? You bet you they do. <coughs> Hotels have a dedicated publicity officer. Strong media contacts. You can't believe how strong they are. Very high. Institutional, uh, sorry, NGOs, they cannot live unless they're driven by publicity that gets them resources. They're grounded in publicity. Very high. Local government is political. So it's a culture that encourages political contact. They, again, are able to get a lot of publicity out of what they do in the CSR arena. And advocates, exactly the same as NGOs, are doing more so. They will die if they don't have that publicity. So we're getting high, 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 high for all of these stakeholders in Phuket. Now, I said there are 11 hotels <coughs> in this particular location. We surveyed them. We asked them. You know, they reported to us what are their CSR projects. And if we look at the number of projects and who they partnered with, only one project, the hotel went alone. Two projects, they partnered with one other person, but an overwhelming 20 of them, they partnered with two or more. So a strong tendency to partner and with more than one person, with one organization. Then we look at the beneficiaries. Did they do this on projects in Phuket, that area, or did they do it elsewhere? Overwhelmingly, 22 of them were Dimby. You know Nimby? Not in my backyard. Well, Dimby, definitely in my backyard. <laughs> and then we thought, are they environmental? Are they social? And we got like a three to one ratio in favor of social. They preferred to work with the community than they did with the environment. Remember, this is external, internal, different story. But that gets tangled up with operational matters. Uh, what do you do with that? Okay. Hotels, organizations, the large ones, they operate globally, a lot of different contexts. And this places limits on their corporate governance for CSR program selection and implementation. What we're seeing is broad policy frameworks that outline the CSR strategy and considerable freedom to operational management to fit their CSR with local economic, social, environmental conditions. On that, I'll finish and thank you very much.